somebody says thank you for having us thank you for coming to this this is this is exciting for us to have this uh, many people interested in, in crappie fishing so we're hoping that uh hope we can help you out and get started with this uh, what lake is that behind you we are on cherokee lake these guys can literally go out the back door and go fishing here and, uh, i think scott said he needs a uh, needs an oxygen tank halfway up his steps but it's pretty <laughs> steep going off the back right here but when i started coming into the, the area where they live i saw the lake immediately and i thought this these guys didn't end up here by accident we got a beautiful home and they literally can go out the back door and go fishing but i want to welcome you to the basic uh, crappie fishing class that we're doing that's hosted by the tennessee wildlife resources agency uh, my name is matt cameron i am the region four outreach and communications coordinator uh, basically a pr guy and um just tickled to death to have you once again um if you have questions, type them into the chat and we will hopefully see them as they pop up and try to answer them as we go. And so I'm, I'm not going to tarry. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to, uh, to Scott and Neil. Um, they'll have to tell you about their titles and all that stuff. They're not, they're not going to toot their own horn or anything, but uh, they, they do very well in crappie fishing. They're very knowledgeable and I'm just tickled to death to have them. So I'm going to go ahead and get them on here um, and we're going to just let them run with it, guys. Guys, this is Scott Bunch and Neil Alvis, and they are hosting this class tonight. And uh, just want to give them a nice warm welcome. Thank you all for doing this, sharing your knowledge. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, appreciate the, the invite. The pleasure is all ours. And so before we get started, I got one question for you. Is it crappie or crappy? <laughs> Crappy's the big ones. <laughs> the big crappie ones. Crappie are these. <laughs> yeah. Crappy are these. Okay. Yeah. I, I've got a friend, Jam Ferguson. He says they're only crappy if you don't catch them. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they taste too good to call crappy, to, oh, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we're going to let you take it and run with it. So wherever you want to start, I'm good with, or if you need me to ask questions to get you rolling. I don't care to do that. Uh, we'll start out and tell you a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we're uh, just a couple hometown East Tennessee guys, lived here all of our lives. Uh, I'm from Marstown, Neil's from uh, Rogersville, and uh, started out uh, fishing together, wading the creeks and uh, in high school, fishing ponds and uh, Kind of got into crappy fishing uh, out as we got out of high school uh, and then got a little more serious about it and uh, the older we got and got into tournament fishing some. Uh, let, uh, I'll let Neil kind of tell you a little bit about uh, what we've done as far as our tournament uh, series and introduce his sale. Okay, my name is Neil Alvis. Uh, like Scott said, we've fished together for about uh, 30 some years now and uh, started out, like he said, started out small way in the creeks and um, just evolved to here. Uh, my brother, he had a, uh, he coined a, a phrase. He said, I'm, a, I'm afraid this ain't a phase you're going through. So we've done it, you know, for a long time. We, we, we just are passionate about the sport especially about the competitive side of it. But uh, um, to tell you a little bit about, you know, um, we, we are on the Crappie Magnet Pro staff. We have been for about seven or eight years now. And lately, again, we enjoy the, the competitive side of it. Um, we, uh, we were fortunate enough last year to win the National Points Championship. Uh, uh, you know, it was just a, a great honor. Uh, the crappie USA, uh, but like Scott said, we're just two old country boys. Is what we are. That uh, we really uh, enjoy this sport, and um, just like you all are here tonight, uh, Scott and I, we're always learning. We're always listening. We're we never um, never stop learning. Never stop learning, and and we've had this mindset from day one. Uh, so. Um, I encourage any, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, to ask. We'll try our best to answer them. Um, and again, we're just super excited to be here tonight. Uh, we appreciate TWRA uh, giving us the, the invite. So we'll just get started. We will keep it simple, uh, basic crappie fishing, and uh, kind of go through uh, the different uh, um, seasons of crappie fishing, if you will, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall, 
But again, don't hesitate to ask questions if you have them. Um, I'll let Scott, Scott start out with, uh, we're gonna talk about the two different types of crappie. There's, uh, there's two different types. I'll let Scott explain those to you. Um, there's a black crappie and a white crappie and uh, I'll see if I can uh, pull up, I've got a, a picture and, and they're, the way they act are totally different. Uh, I just had it. I'm, I apologize. Um, okay, here we go. These fish react totally different. Uh, the black crappie is generally a shallow, uh, a shallow oriented fish. This right here is a uh, picture of a black crappie. I don't know. Uh, right there's a pretty good represent, representation. Um, they're uh, speckled. A lot of people call them specks. Uh, they're speckled all over where a white crappie is. A, and these are, the black crappie is a little more football shaped. Uh, and the black crappie have a smaller mouth than what the white crappie does. And uh, they say they eat more bugs than what a white crappie does. A white crappie is more uh, bait fish oriented. And, uh, but there's a, a actually a live picture if I can uh, get it to pick up better. See how it's speckled all over. And uh, I'll show you a picture of a white one as well. Um, but go ahead. And the, these two fish can be as different as a bluegill and a catfish at certain times of the year. So it's important to, when you start out, uh, kind of kind of have a game plan of what, you know, which species you're going to uh, target. So. Uh, like Scott said, the black one are they're more structure oriented, uh, rocks, ledges, stumps. A white one are more schooling fish, you know, out in the open water, uh, bunched up. Um, this right here's a picture of the white crappie. They have vertical bars, uh, and both species will turn. The males will turn real dark, and a lot of people think that they have a black crappie when they catch one in the early spring, but the males will put on what they call their tuxedos. Uh, but the white crappie and the black crappie, when they move up shallow to spawn, the males are territorial and they'll turn a real black uh, color phase uh, to, to kind of show off to the females. So that's that's the gist of a black crappie and a white crappie. Um, so, and again, it's important to, to kind of understand a little bit about each one. TWRA does an awesome job with uh, stocking a black nose crappie. Uh, uh, some of you may have seen them, I'm not sure, but they are a black species. So they, um, they have uh, the same characteristics as a black one. Um, but uh, it's a good way to help them identify how the, uh, how productive their stocking's been. Uh, it's a, a subspecies of the black one. It looks like uh, you took a black magic marker and went from the tip of their nose up into where it meets their fins and has a little spot under their chin as well. But uh, you you see how uh, you can see how those fish have, uh, I guess, how productive, mm -hmm. uh, how productive mm -hmm. uh, that the stocking program has been by how many you catch over a, a certain year class. You you may catch a lot of small fish and then you can kind of see the three and four years down the road, it has, uh, you'll, you'll have a lot of, they actually breed out. They'll have uh, portions of that little black mark where they've bred back with regular black crappie and kind of see see the success rate that you're seeing over the past years. So these blacks and whites, do you find them um, in, it's mixed in the same school of fish or are they completely separate as far as their um, yeah, That's, that's, that's a awesome real good question. question. Yeah. Uh, the, the black fish are generally, uh, like I touched on just a minute ago, they're a shallow oriented fish. Uh, we target the black crappie and the black nose. A lot of times they'll hang out. We actually target those in the fall. Uh, they like to hang on uh, rocky type structure, uh, blowdowns on bluffs, uh, and 
up shallow in the spring uh, in end of March, 1st of April, and we'll, we'll touch seasonal basis, but uh, you'll see these fish that will be up in three and four foot as they come up to spawn uh, in the rocky type areas. They like to, they like to hold the brush uh, and usually on steeper banks is where we target the black fish. Uh, shallow water, but steeper banks, rockier type structure. Uh, yeah, I'll let him touch on the white crappie. Kind. Yeah, the white ones, you know, you do see, sometimes you can see these fish together, uh, especially in the springtime when, when everything's moving and and wanting to spawn, you can uh, say you're long line trolling, you can catch your black one and white ones together. So um, they're not always uh, separate, but um, uh, uh, a lot of times in the spring, you will see both these uh, both species together. Um, and when these fish are spawning, you'll notice uh, the black crappie will generally spawn about two to three weeks before the white crappie will. Uh, the black is here in East Tennessee uh, would usually be the end of March, uh, first of April. A lot of times the white crappie will be on up in uh, middle of April, all the way up into May. So they're, they're a, a little different. Uh, the blacks move a little bit quicker to shallow water uh, for their spawning rituals than what the white ones do in general. So we're just gonna move right along. And again, you know, we're gonna do seasonal um, techniques or patterns. Um, we're going to start. I'll let Scott start with uh, spring, and we'll, and again, we'll, we'll try to keep it simple. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. But you know, uh, these are just some of our techniques that are that we've used in the past. There's all kinds. Uh, remember that. But uh, I'll let Scott talk uh, talk a little bit about the spring technique. Uh, the spring time is probably the easiest time for uh, the inexperienced angler and uh, and it's a great way to get kids out uh, on the lake and keep it simple for them. Uh, just a hook and a minnow and a float. Uh, a lot of times you don't have to have a lot of the fancy graphs and, and other stuff to find fish this time of year. You can have uh, most of the time in late March, early April, you're actually going to be fishing stuff that you can actually see the top of it sticking out of the water. Uh, uh, you can you can reach them by the bank. Uh, it's the best time for a bank fisherman. I mean, you can walk the banks. Uh, TWRA has uh, fishing piers uh, here on Cherokee Lake. And, and I know there's a lot of public accesses in, uh, uh, we've seen them on Old Hickory. Uh, we've seen them on Watts Bar. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they have these uh, fishing piers or uh, areas that has shallow brush that uh, Tennessee Wildlife's put out to attract fish and also to uh, areas that once the fish spawn that the uh, that the yearlings can actually hide and keep from getting eaten uh, in some of the structures that are putting out now. So is, is brush key for crappie in general? It's a uh, for for an inexperienced angler. Uh, the more brush you've got, the better the better off you are. Um, you know, we fish brush. You can fish brush year round. Um, it just depends on the depth and all that. But the more brush you've got, uh, as far as crappie fishing goes, uh, you know, um, the we better really off. like wood structure. Yeah, uh, wood structure is a great place to start. Uh, and the stuff that you can see is always the easiest to fish. Uh, and you can take a kid, hook men in a float, you can't go wrong, split shot. And, uh, but there's also uh, a lot of other, for the people that's a little more experienced, they, uh, you can uh, long line troll. That's where you put out multiple rods and, uh, but at multiple rods to cover uh, several different depths of water. These fish are moving kind of in the spring as the water warms, they're gonna move back into the creeks to that shallower water to spawn. Uh, and maybe before they get up there to where 
they're catching them on a float in a minute or a jig in a minute in that shallow water, you'll see them uh, progress back into these, uh, your main creeks. Like here on Cherokee, you have uh, uh, Poor Valley Creek, and then you've got German Ray Creek is a few of the, uh, it's usually the Northern creeks, uh, the Northeastern creeks that uh, catches the most and warms up the quickest. Uh, you'll see the same things on other lakes that you go to all across the state. Uh, just find Douglas, you've got McGuire Creek, Flat Creek, uh, Indian Creek, uh, Muddy Creek. There's a lot of different creeks, and that's a good place to start as, as you get into spring. These fish are heading back in those creeks. What water temperature will they spawn at? Uh, we like uh, a consist consistent 60, 63 to 65. Uh, you get uh, a lot of times you get surface temperature and uh, you may have a day or two that it gets 65 of the evening after you had sun on it all day. And then at night it drops back and you're back in the mid fifties. It And it takes several, uh, several days of that consistent type weather. Uh, that, there's a lot of factors go in to the fish holding in there. And a lot of the, a lot of times that danger muddy water, you'll notice warms quicker. Uh, Darker, it just absorbs the sunlight. It does, it, it's got more particles in the water and it, and it holds that heat. Uh, clear water, uh, the light will penetrate, but it's, uh, there's nothing really to grab that heat. And it, uh, the, you'll, you'll tend to see the fish are a little deeper in that clear water too. One thing with spring, I, I want to add, this is probably um, these fish are, uh, they're moving, they're moving up the creeks, watch cold fronts. Uh, you know, if you're catching fish uh, one day, uh, a cold front, you know, comes through, these fish will, uh, uh, they are affected uh, heavily, heavily by cold fronts um, in the spring. Uh, they're not as stable as fall and summer and all that. So. Um, don't get discouraged if you catch them one day and, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, 60, 70 degrees and that cold front comes through and it knocks it back, you know, in the 50s. So um, they are susceptible to um, cold fronts in the spring. So And, and a lot of times they don't uh, totally leave the area. A lot mm -hmm. of times they just back back out to the first drop. Uh, they'll, uh, they'll hold out and kind of... Uh, once it picks back up, warms back up, they'll they'll move back. But you you can uh, if you're catching them back shallow in uh, eight and ten foot of water, you may back back to the first drop at uh, 12, 14 foot, and uh, those fish will just kind of hold off. Uh, a lot of times they'll be tighter to structure uh, when you have these cold fronts and stuff, uh, and a lot of times they'll be a little more uh, sluggish uh, on those cold front conditions, but. Uh, it's and there's a lot of them uh, that rolls through in the spring. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like uh, when your buddy catches them two or three days before you get to go, everything's changed. Uh, one, one of those, those one of those should have been here yesterday. Dude. Uh, so you know, you know what I'm saying? Or on the next day after oh, you yeah. go, yeah. that drives me insane. All right, a couple questions if you, okay. have, if you have time, okay? Yeah. Uh, Miles Lampo was asking, is it better to fish before a cold front or after, or is it more about the water temperature? Uh, that's a good question, Miles. I'll let Scott answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fish anytime you can. Uh, uh, no we, we, we uh, a lot of people go by barometric pressure, and uh, uh, we, we've got full time jobs. So, we're uh, anytime we can fish, we're trying to fish. Uh, but pre, uh, pre front conditions is definitely the fish feed better uh, coming into the front. Right as the front passes through is when. Uh, they seem to shut down uh, when you, you when you got the cloudy skies and you see the clear skies right behind it. Temperature usually drops right then. Wind, usually get some wind winds with it uh, mm -hmm. picking up. That's that's the toughest time for us uh, to catch fish is right when it passes, uh, just as it passes through. Uh, post conditions uh, can be a little tough, but uh, as far as the cloudy, the rain, uh, I really, 
the fish is generally pretty good yeah. in those conditions compared to just right after the front pieces. Great question, great answer. And then uh, and somebody else asked about a drone video. Have y'all ever done a drone video or somebody ever recorded y'all from a drone fishing? We have uh, a couple times. Do um, you remember who did it? They're, they said it looked great. They were just wondering who did that. Yeah, uh, Doug Finley yeah. and uh, uh, and I'll let Neil take it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Pass the buck right back. Hold on, uh, you caught us off guard. Yeah, we did one. It's uh, it was uh, with crappie magnet. They they titled it with crappie magnet. You can go to YouTube and, and look it up. Um, uh, I think it's crappie magnet. Crappie magnet intro. Or you can get to it by Scott Bunch Crappy or something. Yeah. Uh, done an awesome job. It, yeah. They were uh, just getting into it, and I mean, uh, it, it was uh, it was pretty neat. We enjoyed it. That's a question from Maxie. Thank you. Yeah, Maxie. Maxie. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> he was he was one of them. Yeah. Okay. I drew a blank. Yeah. That's Jonathan. Good. Yeah. Get to go to YouTube and check that out. Then. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right. Proceed. Okay. Uh, we've talked about spring, uh, just touched on it, and you know we're just going to kind of move right along uh, through the season. Well, we'll go talk next about summer. So, um, you know, when we started out, you know, usually after spring, uh, you know, 20 years ago, we'd put our stuff up. You know, we'd be doing other stuff. There's all kinds of good fishing in the summer, and um, you know, it's uh, here lately. You know, it's became you know one of my favorite times to fish. Uh, you've got the lake to yourself. You go early, you got the lake to yourself. When you hear that first jet ski coming or wake, wake boat, that's, uh, that's time to go in my opinion. But if you go early, you've got the lake to yourself. Um, I've never had any issues, you know, uh, fishing any brush or anything like that with other anglers in the summer. Um, I'll let Scott talk a, a little bit about the technique we use and uh, but yeah, give summer a try. It's awesome. And like Neil said, you don't have any competition. Uh, and right now, while the water's down, if you get out on the lake and uh, ride around, if you have a boat, uh, the disadvantages of living on Cherokee and some of these highland reservoir lakes is the water draws down. Some of the advantages is the water draws down. That's right. Uh, a lot of stuff, uh, the, di the disadvantages is uh, brush that's put in by random people or TWRA or however brush gets there is exposed in the, when the water's down at its lowest. And a lot of times, if you'll get out and do your homework, uh, even if it's stuff that you hadn't built, you can get out and ride around and find tons of structure. Uh, and I'm not just talking about wood. You can find foundations, old house foundations, uh, uh, other lakes that you have silos that's been blown or blown over or uh, tore down, makes rock piles. There's all kinds of structure, structure that's exposed and as this water comes up, a lot of, if you look at uh, TVA actually has a, uh, a website that you can go and it shows the past history of uh, the past couple of years of where they like to keep the water at certain dates. A uh, great tool to use uh, as far as knowing where you're, what depth you're gonna be fishing in say March or uh, I think 1075 is full on Cherokee. They usually keep it around 1071, 1072 in the summer. But when you see these brush piles and the water level is at 1050 and they're right at the edge of the water, you know that that stuff is gonna be about 22 foot deep, uh, which is prime summer depth. Okay. So anywhere from seven, I'm gonna say 17 to 23 foot is uh, some of my favorite dates for any, any time really, but early in the morning, uh, even, or they well, have even, even when they're, uh, in the summer, uh, they're usually at that depth, uh, pretty consistent. And what's so good about the summer, you don't have a cold fronts, That's right. uh, everything's, uh, you don't have much change. Pretty consistent. It, it they, is. They are consistent. You know, 
it's post spawn. They've, you know, they've, they've went up and laid their eggs are not moving as much. So, um, you know, what I, we have found, you know, that, you know, a lot of times in the summertime, uh, they're there, they're going to stay there. Now, one thing to note that, you know, if you hit a brush pile today and you catch uh, six or eight off of it, they don't replenish as quickly as they do in the spring because they're not moving. It seems like they're, this is their home for the summer. So if you hit them hard one day and you go back and you're like, where are they at? You know, um, they're probably at the house. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Freezer, in the freezer. somebody's freezer. Somebody's and, uh, freezer. Uh, something that's really good is if you'll get out this time of year, do your homework, get several spots. That way you can, you can make, if you fish the German Creek area, uh, you fish those maybe one day and you get to go again uh, four or five days later, may have some, uh, find some brush in a different area, a whole different part of the lake. And uh, in the summertime, you'll notice that uh, a lot of times, not necessarily on the creek channels, they may be out on the main lake on uh, flats and stuff or in, in your major creeks on flats and stuff that'll be in that 17 to even 25 we've caught we we catch some fish as deep as 35 and 40 foot but a good a good depth and the structure is going to be out of the water in the winter you can go back and fish that same depth in that uh 17 to 23 foot range everybody's got a phone in their pocket with a camera these oh, yeah. days you can take pictures and know exactly what that looks like at that spot when you come back to it that, that's a good it. point there's there's we'll touch a little bit on, on the you know uh tips and techniques but that's awesome everybody's got it and and the, the technology the technology's out there. out there and it makes it so much easier than you know uh used to we'd have to line up on this cedar and this pole and no, yeah it's triangulate not, yeah. oh yeah yeah i'm gonna uh, throw this out there you know i was telling you earlier we were out on cherokee putting the reef balls mm -hmm. out and you say right now what stuff's that stuff that's at the water line would be about prime for crappie in the summer is that what uh, you're thinking it may be just just a little deep but uh well the water's come up a little that and that would yeah, probably be uh, about yeah. right so if, if y'all are on charity for example you can get out in um Granger county park go out of the boat ramp to the main channel and turn right and about a half mile down you'll see a lot of these reef balls that we've placed out there and we are tying brush to them um, cutting cedars and, and tying them. So they're, and they're, they're varying depths too. They're not all right at the water line. Right. So you're looking for places on Cherokee to fish. Um, there's some right there at Granger County Park, right off the ramp. If you're standing on the ramp, look at the lake to the left, then go out to the main channel as well and hang a right half mile down. Plenty of structure there. If y'all are scouting in this area. So yeah. And, and area. TWA, we've, uh, they have a lot of, uh, and, and you can pull up a map on, uh, the website, uh, and we do this even as tournament anglers. We'll go to a different lake and a different state, different state, yeah. and that's one of the first tools that we look at is the DNR for these yeah. uh, certain lakes. Even even oh, though yeah. they're even though they're public, uh, those fish don't know that they're public beds right. uh, and and community holes and stuff exactly. so don't be afraid of fishing though exactly oh, no, there no. that's a, that's a great there's a, we catch a lot of fish on stuff that uh, the state has put out and marked for everybody to go fish and they're marked with buoys uh lots of different types of structure that they put out i know one uh percy priest and uh some of them they'll have state beds that's marked with a, a white pole when the fish are up shallow. Uh, and, and this is summer. You're going to have the lake to yourself early. Uh, you know, now, uh, you know, it can get crowded, you know, in the afternoon and all that, but um, you won't have any trouble. Um, you won't have to compete with any uh, other anglers, usually in the summer. One more question, I'll okay. quit interrupt you. People are asking about colors and spring and summer and such. Is that something you're going to touch on later? Or? We will, mm -hmm. uh, okay. and we can we can touch as far as colors. Uh, the season don't really seem to matter as much as uh, your water clarity. The water clarity, I think, drives that more than anything. Uh, your uh, real stained water. Uh, uh, a week a week or so ago, we seen the uh, water flush here behind us, it was not hardly chocolate milk, but really stained. Uh, usually black and chartreuses, uh, 
your oranges, uh, hot pink. Uh, I thought I had a uh, hot pink right here. Uh, a few colors. That's uh, the black and chartreuse. We use a uh, these right here. Are a, a crappy magnet bait that we use, and uh, this is actually a slab magnet. And we use these during the summer. This is a black and chartreuse. Uh, a real dingy water. This right here is a great bait. A black, uh, and I had some. Uh, here's another bait. It's uh, real bright. Uh, right there, you can see it a little better. Real bright chartreuse. Your oranges, your pinks, stuff that's really going to stand out or silhouette yourself with the black. Uh, in the water that's real clear, you may go to a. Uh, uh, more neutral color, a, a natural type. Uh, this right here is kind of a uh, pearl, pearl with chartreuse. Uh, a lot of even translucent colors uh, uh, show enough on the on the crappy magnet and monkey milk from Bobby Garland and different uh, ju just your clear baits with clear water and uh, real stained water. I'd go with the the black or the the real bright neons. So similar like bass fishing. That's it is mm -hmm. what those guys mm -hmm. talk about. Yeah. Darker mm -hmm. baits for darker Dark, water and yeah. lighter baits for clear water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, and something uh, you've got certain lakes like Teleco, Norris. Uh, you want something. Uh, you want something that is a clear or a real translucent bait, a natural color like a. Uh, we use a pumpkin pie. Uh, it's pumpkin seed color mm -hmm. with chartreuse or a, uh, it's called a show nip and chartreuse uh, right there. It's it's a real translucent bait and then just a touch of, uh, a touch of uh, chartreuse to, and we, we may fish those on a jig head. That right there is a bait that we actually uh, fish when we're long line trolling or in the spring when the fish are real active and we'll cast these and uh, the curl tail has a lot of action and the fish are more aggressive in that state. In the summertime, we're using more of a, uh, we call it dead sticking or uh, vertical jigging right over top of the brush. And we'll use uh, something that's maybe not moving as much. It's uh, sometimes you'll <clears throat> hold it just dead still and the fish will sit there and look at it and you twitch it just a little and it's just like a they had all they could stand and <laughs> yeah. just hammer it thin. And you but, running these uh, on a, a jig head for most part? We do. Yeah. We just uh, fish a, uh, based on kind of on the depth water is the size of jig heads that we use. Uh, a good rule of thumb that I use is if I'm 10 foot or less, I'll use uh, a little 16th ounce. That's a double cross jig head kind of spreads, spreads the split tail grub out. Uh, but a 16th ounce uh, in 10 foot or less. And you can go even to a 32nd if you're fishing, uh, especially in the spring on stuff that you're seeing uh, that's real shallow. Because uh, the heavier head, the faster it's going to get hung up. Uh, but a 32nd ounce in that real shallow water, uh, 16th, maybe uh, 10, 12 foot. And then when you get on into that deeper depth, uh, you want an eighth ounce or even a three sixteenth, something just a little heavier to get you down there quicker. Uh, and he, he talked just a little bit about getting hung up. Don't get discouraged because if you're fishing brush, um, expect to get hung up. So, um, you know, there's uh, just fish over the brush if you can, you know, with a floater or something like that, that'll help. Um, but, you know, when you get hung up again, don't get discouraged, you're going to. Uh, one. One thing on the summer, uh, Scott was talking about, they get lazy in the summer, just like they do in the winter time. So um, they're not they're not as apt to, to run this bait down here. Uh, you need to put it kind of in front of them and, and uh, uh, that works best. But, All right, question about summer fishing before you move on. Uh -huh. Ken Stewart says, are black and white crappie found at the same depth and on the same cover in the summer? That's uh, that's a good question, Ken. Um, typically, again, this is post spawn for the most part, but usually we find more white ones on the brush that we fish. Now we fish uh, 
brush that are located on big flats. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily target uh, ledges or stumps or rocks, but you, you can find black ones with them. But for the most part, I would say 75% of them are gonna be white ones. Um, and typically they're better fish. I don't know why, but, but you know, in the summertime, uh, you know, they're, they've laid out, but they're, they're seem like a, a better year class or something, you know, the 12, 13, 14 inch fish. So, um, I think a lot of it's work. We, we usually target the white fish out on the flats. So I said the main lake or mm -hmm. your major creeks. Uh, I think the black fish is more on bluffy type mm -hmm. areas. A lot of people night fish for them in the summer, put out lights, uh, submersible lights, and they fish on, uh, real steep banks or bluff type structures, uh, sometimes on bridge pillars and they'll bring the bait to them. And, uh, and it's generally black crappie that you catch mm -hmm. at night on that steeper banks and, uh, the rockier type structures. It's usually the black crappie. I know when Douglas mm -hmm. she'll catch some white crappie, but, uh, I'd say it's back the same way. It's probably 75 to 80% black crappie at night. at night. Yeah. And then the white crappie out on the flats and stuff on brush. And, uh, even people will troll, uh, crankbaits. Uh, a lot of people like to troll it's a pretty easy method. If you got rod holders, uh, they, there's different arts to it, but, uh, you've got different crankbaits that run different depths. Uh, you can get just as technical as you want to, as far as having dipsy divers uh, that'll take you to certain depths, or you can uh, take a band at 300s and make a long cast and they're gonna get down to about 16, 17 foot deep. And a lot of these lakes will develop a thermocline and uh, you can run those things a mile and a half an hour, set your GPS to run that speed and kick back with your umbrella and uh, uh, it's, it's usually hot. I'm talking that part of the summer is usually on up in August and September. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hot, but those fish will get in that thermocline where there's not a real good oxygen level below that point. And those fish will suspend it. Different lakes will have different depth, uh, and you can turn your graph real sensitive and you can actually pick that thermocline up to where you're seeing, uh, almost looks like a false bottom. Uh, if you've got your uh, graph uh, set real sensitive, uh, it'll show that thermocline and that kind of gives you an ideal because you won't catch very few fish below that because the oxygen level just ain't there for them to live. And that's for uh, pretty much all species. It, it, it uh, is. It's, uh, and, and a lot of times you can see that thermocline and you can find structure just above that depth and fish that structure uh, on that body of water too. Great. Uh, and does line weight matter on trolling? Uh, what do you like? Do y'all troll? I mean, you like to troll and turn the Oh, yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, you, what was the question? Does what it, line weight do you use for trolling? We typically use a four pound test. I mean, and like Scott says, there's all kinds of different setups that you can do. But but if it's if it's a typical long line with a jig, um, you know, it, it's uh, four pound test. Yeah. We use high vis line. Uh, you know, if you've got your lines back in the springtime when we're doing this, you know, sometimes there's some trash on the water. Uh, we use the high vis line. It helps to keep, make sure your lines are running straight because you don't want um, lines crossing and all that. And that makes a mess. So um, kind of keeps everything in line yeah. when you could see your line back sure. there behind the boat. So like Mr. Crappie, for example, that yeah. bright yellow uh, line. That's that's cool. that right there's Bass Pro brand. Uh, and then you've got uh, vicious. I mean, there's there's tons of different uh, high vis lines that we use, okay. uh, and, and a lot of good. And for trolling, that's all we use is a high vis line. Uh, something in the summer, and when we're uh, fishing structure or brush piles and stuff, a lot of times uh, we'll use a we use a live scope as well. Uh, it's new technology. Those. It's, it's, it's crazy how, uh, how good they are. But anyway, uh, something that you can use, I use a gliss. It's, uh, Arctic gliss, uh, not sponsored by them or anything, but it's a, uh, it's almost like dental floss. It's, it's a, uh, don't have stretch to it. Uh, and we'll actually, uh, use 
I like it better than braid personally uh, because it casts better, it slides through your guides better. And, uh, but I'll backfill with old monofilament and then just put uh, maybe, I think it's a hundred foot roll on this and I'll make it two different reels set up. And then I'll put a floor carbon leader. And when I'm, when I'm doing that, the floor carbon is practically invisible. It don't have stretch. And a lot of times I'll use a longer rod. We're, uh, b and is one of our sponsors as well. And uh, I love their eight foot, like Russ Bailey rod. It's it's a little longer that you can, and you can control your jig with it. But what I don't like is on those longer rods, they flex a lot. And with that, uh, either a braid or that gliss, it don't have the stretch. So when you make, when you set the hook, with those longer flimsier type rods, uh, you don't make contact with the fish as quick. That uh, that line, it don't stretch where mono does. So that gets you back to using a more sensitive shorter rod that you would have mono on. It gives you that same feel. Uh, plus with that braid and, the, uh, and that gliss on the live scope, you can actually see your line it's that sensitive that you can see your line uh, going through the water. Is you that a kind forward of, facing? Uh, it is. Sonar, is that it is. Mean? It's uh, it's actually a live feedback uh, per se. That uh, instead of having to get directly over top of a brush pile, mm -hmm. you can actually see the brush pile twenty foot out in front of you. It's it's okay. uh, not get on top of them and spook them. Exactly, mm -hmm. especially in shallow water. Uh, you can uh, you can see where the brush is or the fish, and not have to get over top of them and and take a chance of spooking them when you buoy. Used to we'd have to uh, if we didn't take a chance and say it's right there. If we had it marked on our GPS or whatever, uh, you'd have to go over it to find exactly where it's at, buoy it, and you get that shallow brush and stuff. A lot of times you'd spook fish off of it and go back to fishing they wouldn't be there god well hopefully i get to go fishing with y'all oh yeah in april and you, yeah, you can I'll demonstrate be. some of this maybe some people will watch yeah, that and be glad to learn about it one more thing if you don't mind it's okay. from brad he asks can you confirm again in general vertical jig dead stick in spring and more act action in summer so you're, you're saying in the summer dead stick yes, more action that's in spring, right. right that's right when when okay, the water's in that uh, the 60 yeah. 70 uh really mid fifties to, uh, I'm gonna say low to mid fifties through the upper seventies, fish are pretty aggressive. When that water temperature gets up in the eighties, they start getting lethargic. Uh, the reason that the crankbaits work, it's more of a reaction bite. Uh, they'll just be sitting out suspended in open water. And when those crankbaits come by, it's more of a reaction mm. instead of them chasing it down running and chasing it down okay. uh and same way in winter uh, a lot of times uh you've got to and we'll touch on that a little uh slowing down your presentation okay excellent thank you we're gonna keep moving right along um we we, uh, we talked a little bit about spring summer um so they do slow down in the summer We'll go right into fall. Uh, fall is um, is one of my favorite times to fish. Um, you know, you're you're ready for that cooler weather. Uh, it's just uh, you know, cooler mornings. The leaves are turning. It's just a beautiful time to be out on the water. So um, we have several techniques in the fall. Um, we well, typically in the fall we go back to targeting the black crappie. Uh, they're on their own blowdowns, their own, uh, you know, steeper banks, rocks, points, uh, docks, uh, you can catch uh, black ones under docks. So, um, you know, we kind of change gears from white ones typically in the summer on brush to the black ones uh, in the fall. But um, get on, get on some steep banks, uh, some blowdowns, um, rock, points, um, it's just uh, it's just a really good time to be on the water. Uh, typically, you know, we're when we target the black ones in the fall, we're not uh, long lining 
anymore. We're casting to them. Um, so, uh, and generally they're from uh, five feet to 15, 20 feet uh, typically. So, um, when you're fishing those blowdowns, uh, what we like to do is actually throw up on the trunk part, which would be shallower in the water column and let it pendle them back. You kind of see how steep the tree is. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, when you when you cast it out, use a lighter head like the 16th ounce to where it can fall slower. And you got you kind of control the steeper that is, the more you let it fall. The shallower it runs out, you just kind of try to swim it just above the main limbs. You don't get a bite there, you may work it, try to work it down through it. Uh, and, and you do get hung a lot. And you're going to get hung. The, the more you do it, the better feel you say, eh, that's not a fish. I'm not going to set the hook. And it's you easing kind of, over a limb, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but if you're not getting hung, you're not getting to where the fish are a lot of mm -hmm. times. And with that being said, if the fish are real aggressive on it, you'll notice that the fish will hit it before you get hung. They won't let you get hung. Yeah. yeah. And and once the fishing slows up, that's when you start getting down into the limbs and stuff. So and you, you're not jerking it, you're just letting it uh, steady. Yeah. And, and you may you may let it fall a little and twitch it a, a little, let it fall. You just you're just kind of visioning it coming down that same trunk or uh the major limbs on that tree, you're just kind of working it down. Uh and swimming it out, letting it fall a little, swimming it out, and just work that whole. And a lot of times you don't have to uh, do a whole lot of reeling until you get back to the boat because you're just working it down the limb the whole time. Yeah. Uh, one one thing to know in the fall, they uh, sometimes the light, the bite can get light. We're, we're using high vis lines, so whatever you do, pay attention to your line. Uh, it might be that that you're watching and it's just a jump. A, a twitch um, in your line, that's a fish. It could be that it hits it hard and puts all kinds of slack in your line. Um, so we use a high vis line, four pound test. Um, there's all kinds of good line out there. So, um, but just pay attention to your line because if they come up and hit it and push it, you won't feel the bite sometimes, uh, but you'll definitely see it. And uh, once you see it and once you get to know, you know, what that bite looks like, then uh, it'll make it so much easier. Um, and I'd say as, as high as 30% of the bites that you get, you'll see instead of feel. Yeah, especially the, the colder the water uh, gets. Seems That's like. where the hive is like. Uh, yes. Oh, oh yeah, like. you got to have it. Here's or, a great, I think. Um, great question. And I think you hit on it. Uh, Justin Adams asked, do you use hive is line all the way to the jig head or, or are you always using clear leader? That's a, a good question, Justin. It just depends on the lake we're on. Um, you know, and typically in the fall, in the brush, if it's stained up, you know, you're going to get hung up. So it might be a challenge for you to, you know, tie a leader, tie a jig all the time. Uh, Scott touched on live scope. You know, we can control our jigs so much better now. You know, we do, uh, especially tournament fishing, we will tie a leader, um, you know, just to, to give us that extra, um, edge if you will especially if the water's clear but if the water's stained up and uh, you know typically we don't use uh, a high vis all the time yeah if, if we get time before y'all get done can you show people how to tie a leader two oh, yeah. pieces mm -hmm. line together yeah. we will okay we'll be glad to all right thank you very much proceed uh that's that's the fall Again, that's one of my favorite times to be on the water. Um, but like Scott said, take advantage of any time you get, you know, if you uh, um, if you get a chance, go to the lake, see what happens. Um, but fall, look for blowdowns, rocks, docks, um, and typically you're going to be fishing for a black rock. And uh, with some exceptions, you got uh, Douglas, which is a great, uh, lake to catch white crappie and they'll they'll actually hold on these uh pea gravelly or river rock mm -hmm. points uh and, and even mud points but uh usually and it's back to that uh 
the black crappie usually catch up shallower on some of these same points. You may back off into the, instead of catching the black in October, November, uh, Neil always says around uh, the World Series is a great time that the black ones really, uh, really start to get fired up. They'll be on rocky type, uh, uh, slaty rocky uh, little points to step off the of bluffs. Uh, and some of those same places uh, and the river rock too, but some of those same places you'll throw up shallow and say six foot to 12, 13, 14 foot and catch blackfish. Uh, so they're near each other is not necessarily right. Exactly. Yeah. And you may back way. off of that same point and fish 18 to 25 foot and catch whitefish. Yeah. Uh, it just, they, they generally are just a little bit shallower uh, not all the time. I mean, we'll, we'll catch some blacks uh, in 30 plus feet, but for the most part, the blacks will be up on the shallow end of that. Gotcha. And are you going to talk any about graphs in detail? Uh, we can. I we don't can. want to interrupt. If you have yeah. a place for what somebody's asking about, you know, it, we'd love to. They get expensive. And oh, they do. Can you suggest something that's good that's not going to break the bank? Uh, we'll, we'll try to touch on that. We're, we just got just a few more. Uh, things and then we'll open it to try to answer any questions that we can. Awesome. Uh, uh, moving right along, we, you know, we're at winter time and this is certainly winter right now. Um, there's all kinds of different techniques uh, that you can do right now. Uh, just know that the fish slow down. Uh, they do get uh, slow. Um, and you've got to slow down. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, just depends on what lake you're on. I mean, we live, this is Cherokee behind us, um, and we, we have Douglas 30 minutes away, so there are two completely different lakes this time of year, in my opinion. Uh, the fish want to move up shallow on Douglas, uh, on the upper end. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you can go over there, and at times there'll be hundreds of boats there, you know, catching them two feet deep uh, in the wintertime. So, you can go to Cherokee right here and you can catch them 40 feet deep. So, uh, I don't both, know. Both white crappie. Yeah. Uh, you, you can catch white crappie on Cherokee 35, 40 foot, and then turn around. Uh, we was at uh, around nine a, a few weeks ago when probably 65, 70 boats and three foot of water. On a uh, creek. Oh, just, uh, just above it, but uh, just, just look for the boats, but they're, mm -hmm. they'll be that way in Indian Creek. They'll be that way in Muddy Creek, just certain areas. Uh, uh, the internet and the, the phone, it's phone a fish. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, you, if you catch them good, uh, if seven or eight people catch them good one day, they may be 25 or 30 boats the next and it just escalates. And, and everybody enjoys catching fish. So, sure. uh, Look, look for one thing in the winter time, they can't stand a lot of current. So the, the, the crappie are not gonna be in current right now. Uh, they're gonna be in eddy holes. They're gonna be tucked in behind stumps. They're gonna be on the backside of ledges or whatever, but you know, they, uh, um, that's, I guess my best tip in the winter time is just, uh, uh, you know, find that, that uh, slack water, if you will, or, or slow water, but, uh, um, was talking about catching them up shallow with the float. Uh, a lot of times, if you're fishing a jig under a float, these fish are, uh, part of it is they're a little sluggish, but part of it is they don't have room to pull the float under. I mean, they're in, in three foot of water. The, a lot of times you'll see your line go sideways or you float they'll pick up on it and the float will just turn, lay down on its side. Uh, they don't even pull it under. Uh, if you've got a live men on there with just a hook and a minna, sometimes they'll hold on to it a little better. But a lot of times if you're working a jig, uh, they'll come under it and lay the float down instead of popping it. Sometimes you'll see them pop it and it'll go back just like it was, but the fish will still be there. Uh, you just got to really pay attention if you're fishing a float uh, because sometimes they'll just do the minor, uh, something minor to it. Uh, and another thing is uh, it's been real popular over the past uh, 10 or so years is uh, spider rigging. Uh, 
you see it a lot in the lakes in, uh, around Mississippi, but hey, it's a great way to catch fish uh, on Douglas and Cherokee. Uh, a lot of times this time of year, the fish will be real close to the bottom. Uh, may find them in the river channel uh, or some of your major creeks. And uh, we used to be in them and have for years, uh, used to, like a B and M pro staff trolling rod or a, uh, that, what is it? B G J P mm -hmm. uh, Bucks graphite jig pole. Something that's got a little sensitivity. You're using a probably a one ounce weight to push in this twenty it, to explain, twenty five. Explain just a little bit about what spider rigging is. To, to spider those rigging that is uh, you've got multiple rods and you're actually pushing them with your trolling motor out the front of the boat. Uh, usually using a 12 to a 16 foot rod. Uh, I like a, at least a 12 foot rod to get it away from a trolling motor. Uh, first, you got to have a set of rod holders uh, and there's all kinds of different kinds, but you're looking at about a hundred dollar for each set and you can make homemade for 30 or $40, but you're actually going to have three rods, four rods. Douglas, you can go uh, and even in the river channel on upper end of Cherokee, you can push these baits a little off the bottom. And a lot of times there's not a lot of structure. It's just a mud bottom. And uh, you can push these faint, push these baits at a real slow speed, like 0.3 to 0.5 mile an hour. As the spring gets faster and you start long lining, you can push those same baits faster and uh, that's where the longer rods come in handy is either in shallower water or moving faster. Uh, but when you're pushing those baits real slow, you can have, uh, they call like a double minnow rig or a caps and Coleman rig. That's where you actually have your sinker that keeps the bait down at, out in front of you to keep it from coming back. Maybe a three quarter ounce weight to a one ounce weight. If you're fishing at 15 to 25 foot depth, and what that does is keeps a rod, the bait almost straight down. It'll drift back just a, a slight bit while you're moving. And you may have a, a plain hook on the uh, a three-way swivel. You've got a plain hook with a tag end of line uh, with no weight. And it just kind of drifts back here behind it. And then the other one, you may have four foot of line and then have that heavier weight. We use an egg sinker and go through that egg sinker three to four times. That way it don't slide up and down the line. Mm -hmm. And then on that bottom hook, you may tie uh, one of the jig heads with a grub. Uh, or or you can use just plain minnows on both of them. Yeah, uh, and that's a great way. It's don't bite off more you can chew. Uh, start out with two or three rods. Yeah. Uh, and but if you're in open water, you can, uh, everything's running the same speed, the same depths. So as long as you don't get into a school of white bass or something like that, you're okay. Uh, it makes it real exciting when the fish are, are biting real good and it keeps you busy enough when things are slow that you, uh, you're you constantly uh, scanning. Uh, a lot of times we'll push uh, eight rods out of the front He'll have four on his side and I'll have four. We'll run a double seat at front and uh, we'll kind of key in on those four rods. Uh, but it, it's it's a fun way to, uh, there's there's all, all kind of different ways that you can fish from a single pole to, uh, at times we'll run, if we're not in a tournament, we may run 16 rods. Uh, push eight out the front, long line eight out the back, yeah, or uh, I have that all watered up. Uh, it uh, and there's and times there. <laughs> there's times you just have to take a knife yeah. and cut it, but uh, I like catching them every way you can. So, what else about about winter fishing? Uh, right just uh, you know, I don't know winter fishing. Slow down. Slow down for sure. Do you have to go smaller in, in, in the winter? A lot of times, uh, lot of times you can go with a uh, a smaller bait in the winter. Uh, we don't most of the time, uh, but uh, well, we usually use like a two inch crappy magnet, which is a split tail. They have a trout magnet. It's about half that size. 
sometimes they'll get a little finicky uh, and use them under a float or whatever up in that shallow water. Sometimes they, uh, when they're lethargic, they will use a little smaller bait. One thing about the winter time, it's don't have a whole nothing about fishing, but uh, you know, dress for it. You, there's nothing worse than being on the lake and being cold. So, you know, uh, dressing layers, uh, windproof stuff if you can, and uh, you know, just be prepared when you go. It'll make your day so much better. Uh, if you think you might need it, throw it in the boat or, or sure. put it in a backpack when you're walking down the bank or whatever it may be. But dress for it. It'll make your uh, it'll make your day a lot better. 100%. Yeah. Uh, that's win that's winter. We've covered, um, you know, the four seasons. Uh, we've got just a few tips that we put together and we want to share with you. Um, and then we'll go questions or whatever you want to do. Um, number one, keep a journal. Uh, it don't take just a little bit to jot some stuff down, you know. Uh, I, you know you don't have to to elaborate, you know, and and water temperature and all that. Just a, a little uh, journal. It will uh, trigger your memory. You know, hey, I caught them in January, uh, Nina Creek, and they uh, they were three foot deep. You know, and that that's something you can go back to in reference. That'll make you a better angler, um, especially just, especially just getting into crappie fishing. Uh, and it gets you to where you can relive that memory. Yeah, uh, good point. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, you can look back on it and it brings that day up all back to you. Yeah. Uh, utilizing your search tools is another one. Uh, we touched on it just a little bit. Uh, there's tons of information like the TVA uh, water level chart. Uh, another one, Navionics has got uh, an online map. You can go to their, uh, you can go to their website and pull up a lake map, and most of them are on high high definition, right there when you're uh, sitting on your couch a month before you ever go to that lake, you can kind of break that lake down and you can actually, uh, there's an app on your phone, I think it's uh, a nine time, nine, $9, 999 for a one time fee and then you can do uh, an updated chart for maybe I'm going off memory, maybe $9 a year to get it higher detail where you can actually shade different water depths. If uh, we're wanting to target fish, we know we're going to a lake in April and we know that the fish generally is in that 10 to 15 foot range and we're looking for structure on that lake. We can shade the other water to kind of eliminate it. We, we can eliminate 80% of the water just by doing that. And then when you're scanning uh, in your boat, you can follow that shaded area to where it uh, keeps you looking in the right areas. Yeah. That's uh, Navionics. It that's is Navionics. And there's other there's charts all, too. But, all kinds. Uh, but that's okay. that's a good one. And and you like I said, you can go to their website and pull up any lake, just about any lake that you want to go to and look at your depth contours. You can look at, uh, it'll show submerged bridges, uh, old ruins, uh, road beds, just a lot of stuff that you want to target. It'll show docks and you can uh, shade those depths to see what docks has poles or something that may be out there in the depth water that fish will hold on them. Uh, Google Maps is, is also a, a great tool, especially on the drawdown lakes. You know, you can look and you can see the brush, um, you know, make your waypoint on it or something like that. Just Anytime you can, you can utilize. Uh, there's a, there's all kinds of knowledge on online. Uh, if you have any trouble with, you know, downloading or anything, I get your kids or your grandkids to help you. They'll be, they'll uh, they'll they'll uh, get you right through it. So we, I think a problem for a lot of guys, including myself, is there's so much stuff out there. You don't know what's good, what's bad. Yeah. So you obviously suggest Navionics. Is there anything else that you can say, hey, we use this and it, it works? Not Navi necessarily a sales pitch, but. Yeah, Navionics, definitely Google Maps. Again, uh, you can see it, TWRA. Uh, you know, uh, Georgia, we, you know, they, they will list, oftentimes they'll list their, their uh, fish attractors. You can go there and, and uh, get way have a lot of places to start off. A lot of uh, places to start off. So just showing up blind and oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. do yeah. your homework. Do your yeah. homework. Like Scott said, do it at the house, you know, on your couch before you ever go. So uh, 
there's all kinds of uh, helpful information out there. Uh, pay attention. You know, uh, we keep on uh, high vis line. Uh, pay attention to your line. Pay attention. Always pay attention. Just if you make a cast and it, and you count it down three seconds and you get a fish. Guess what? Do it again. Repeat it. You know, uh, if you make a cast and you count it down three seconds and you get hung, you know. I want to shallow up just a little bit, but always pay attention to what you're doing, uh, to what you know, how the fish are reacting to uh, your baits. Um, let's talk to you a little bit about the next one. Uh, patient and confidence. Uh, be patient, and the more the more you do something, the better you get at. You're going to gain confidence, and uh, a lot of times having confidence is you're going to catch a fish. Uh, makes you it, it keys you in uh, it just makes everything so much easier i mean uh for years i thought you couldn't catch a fish unless you had a minnow on your bait uh, my uncle uh i'm that guy <laughs> yeah and uh i was too uh we probably haven't had a minnow in our boat in the past two years oh that's huge to hear, uh, to hear that but it, it's uh the having confidence in what you're using whether it be uh and it ain't gonna dad had a saying he said you may not have to have a minute but it ain't gonna hurt uh <laughs> so and I, another one was uh found it easier to feed them than to fool them so there's a lot of uh pros and cons but uh something else i'm going to touch on just a little on the winter is uh is the slab bites uh so, some scent yeah. or something it may make a difference when those fish are sluggish and they come up to look at a bait or whatever whether they take it or not uh, uh we use that uh slab bites by crappy magnet and they, they stay on the hook pretty good and uh and they make a difference a little marshmallow looking yes yeah, what they, uh, they really make a difference when fish are finicky when uh when they're biting good it, it's no big deal. So, like, you might run yeah, that you. with a slab yeah. bite on top. Yeah. Uh, let me pull one of these. Uh, I'll pull one of these uh, regular crappy magnet a little split tail. It works great with little crappy magnet split tails because uh, when you thread this right here on there, I may have to get my glasses before I can <laughs> even see it. But uh, when you thread it in, you start right there on the end of the bait there you go slide it right through the end of the bait and then uh your hook comes out right in the right in the center of the two splits and then you take that little slab bite and slide on the end of your hook and it'll it'll sit and it'll actually flare the uh the split tail and that's what that double cross uh see how it keeps it spread out i'm hardly moving it and it's got all kinds of action. Uh, and then that slab bite will actually fit there and it keeps it spread out about like this. Uh, gives you a little extra scent uh, just to give you that little extra edge. Good stuff. Uh, one more tip, last one, I guess, and in my opinion, the most important is enjoy your experience. Uh, anytime you get a uh, chance to be on the water and, and uh, you know, um, just soak it up. You know, if it's a sunrise or a, a turkey gobble or a, a eagle fly over your head or something, you know, it ain't all about the, the fish and, and loading the boat every time you go. Um, enjoy your time. Enjoy, uh, you know, God's creation. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and I always take something away from it, you know, whether it be, you know, you go and you don't catch a fish just say, hey, you know, I, well, I'm better back in my boat in the water now, you know what I'm saying? Or I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know what I mean? Take something away from it and, and always learn, uh, enjoy your time. And uh, uh, again, Scott and I, we fished together for over 30 years. This this room wouldn't hold the memories that we've got, you know what I'm saying? And, and we just, we, we really enjoy being out there. And, and you're not always going to hit a home run when you go. So keep that in mind and, uh, and try to learn every time you go, oh, yeah. uh, whether it's learn what to do or what not to do. Yeah.
uh, and about we, what not to do most we, of the time. We, we've, we've definitely had our fair share of those. No doubt. Well, tell me about some of your favorite lakes across the state. I know we're here in East Tennessee and I'm more relative to them, but mm -hmm. we got people from all over the place listening. So help us out where other guys can go fish across the state. Oh, there's, uh, the state's full of some really good crappie fishing. I'm telling you, uh, you know, we're, we're home to East Tennessee. Uh, of course, Cherokee is our home lake. Uh, we, we fish with the East Tennessee Crappie Club. Yeah. Uh, great group of guys. Uh, it, uh, it's, I guess this is a, probably our eighth year, uh, started out with about 30 members. And uh, I would say most years, uh, the past two or three years, uh, to be, to fish tournament, uh, it's, I think it's $35. That's including mm -hmm. big fish and it's a $35 membership fee. Annual? Annual membership okay. fee. And uh, money uh, stays in the club. We bought scales with it uh, each past two years. We've took a uh, club trip to uh, Lake Hartwell and the, and the housing was paid. Uh, bought pizza one night for uh, the guys that went. Everybody, uh, Everybody's welcome to go uh, and the club will pay. I think we've uh, had maybe eight or 10 go uh, out of the group. Uh, That's South Carolina. It is. That, that's where we, that was kind of our group trip. Uh, and then we've actually been three years. The first year was at High Rock Lake over in North Carolina. We just try to uh, go as a, as a group to uh, these other places, but it's open to everybody and uh, just get to meet a lot of great people. And uh, we, the lakes we fish is Cherokee, Douglas, uh, Teleco, Loudon, Watts Bar, Chickamauga and Mountain Hill. So if, if I mention one of your lakes and you're watching, come out and be with us. You know, uh, if you don't want to fish the tournament, come to the weigh-in. You know, we, we always communicate, we share information all the time. Um, so, you know. And if you got any questions about it, uh, look up uh, East Tennessee Crappy Club. Uh, uh, a lot of times we'll do a, uh, uh, three or four guys will do a seminar in the summer. Uh, we've had them at uh, this year's been a little bit different because of the COVID and everything, but uh, uh, we've had on the water demonstrations. Uh, five or six of the guys will, uh, we may teach somebody about graphs, uh, and it's usually four club members. Uh, we may teach uh, uh, maybe somebody else tell you, show you how to shoot docks and Somebody uh, may show you how to find structure, or how to long line, or how to pull planter boards. Uh, it, it's a great group of guys, and if uh, uh, if you're looking for, it's not that even though it's tournaments and we love the competition of that as well, it's more of a uh, family feel and uh, gives you something to look to as uh, as you meet up with all your friends. Uh, each month we, we fish one tournament one lake a month from september through april so that, that gives you that one weekend to look forward to meeting up with everybody and usually there'll be anywhere from uh probably 14 to 20 25 boats uh had as high as 28 boats uh i think we've got somewhere between 75 and 100 members total uh this year so uh uh Great, it's just a great group of guys. A lot of good. Are you on social media? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Matt Zenos is our club president. How do you spell that? Uh, M A T T X E N O S. Okay. And, uh, uh, and it's East Tennessee Crappy Club. On uh, They have their own Facebook page too. And uh, just shoot him a message or something if you got any interest. And uh, on that, it shows. Uh, we fish the third Saturday ever, uh, every month, February. It's actually going to be on uh, Cherokee. So, uh, like Neil said, if you if you're uh, a little bit leery of fishing the tournament, come out and meet the guys and and see what it's all about. It's not the bass fishing uh, setting. It's it's very laid back. 
Uh, usually the winners, the top two or three teams will share how they caught their fish, whether it was, they, they ain't gonna tell you I caught uh, on this brush pile, but sure. uh, we caught fish uh, long line trolling in 20 cent foot of water in German Creek or uh, pretty good details. And, uh, and, and we learned from that. And, and I think, uh, as the past seven or eight years has went, you've seen how a lot of the people in the club has really grown as anglers as well. Josh Sanders says it's, he's in the club. It's his first year yeah. owning a boat and being in the club. He recommends it to anybody wanting to learn. Oh, oh yeah. It's a it's, testimonial here. It is. Yeah. It's, but to answer your question, I think it was, a uh, our favorite lake. Man, that's a hard, a hard choice. You can, sorry, here you go. If you could fish one lake for crappie for the rest of your life, what lake would it be? If you could only fish one. Only fish one? In Tennessee. In Tennessee? Sure. Uh, it, it would be a toss up between Watts Bar and Chickamauga. I'd, I'd want to fish them both. He, uh, he said that he would like to retire in Spring City. That's right. That way he could, yeah, he could be in both forth. of them. Yeah. Uh, Watts Bar for the size, the, they yeah. have monsters and chick mog for the numbers unreal numbers yeah. of black especially black crappie yeah uh and watts bar has a uh good population of big white fish yeah uh so watts bar um, and chicken boy chickamauga is a sports and paradise apparently because that's oh, where yeah. catching those big f1 hybrid yeah. large mouth large, mouth, yeah. large mouth. yeah uh 40 plus pound bikes in the spring yeah uh, on five fish, I mean, that's just yeah. uh, crazy. And I think it's awesome that you still got the great crappie fish in there, oh, yeah. too. Yeah, to oh, that's probably what to eat. No, yeah. <laughs> you know those crappies. Yeah, <laughs> now, there's so many crappie that's in that uh, under 10 inch class. A lot of 10 inch fish, too, but there's oodlums. Uh, you, you may see fish out in open water or under a dock or on a blowdown. They may be three or 400 fish uh, in one school. And, uh, and and we've actually caught bass uh, fishing under docks yeah. with a little old thirty-second ounce grub and catch five and six pound largemouth. And I'm sure that those bass are probably eating some of those three and four inch crappie. I'm yeah. sure. Oh yeah, they eat anything uh, smaller than them they oh, catch. Yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have time to to recommend a graph if somebody's just looking for man? I need something to start with. Uh, I guess what something that's really crucial to us. Uh, we love live scope. It's, it's a high dollar investment, but I guess more importantly than the live scope, especially if you fish different lakes other than your home lake, your home lake, you can put your own stuff out uh, or go to TWRA or whatever and see what they have. But when you go to a different lake, uh, get some type of unit that has side scan. It's worth the extra money. Just where uh, some lakes will go and spend uh, one that we fished for one of the classics. We spent over 90 hours. Uh, oh, Hickory. Oh, Hickory. Uh, just idling, looking for structure. Yeah. Uh, wow. We, we've got uh, that's between 500 the two waypoints on Oh, Hickory. And, you know, Scott touched on side scan. I feel like uh, one with GPS, uh, make sure that it's got a GPS. Uh, if you have to save your nickels up or whatever, uh, you know, just get you one with GPS because, um, you know, you can put a waypoint on it and it don't matter what lake you're on, you can go back two years later and you can go right to that waypoint. You don't have to remember it's in front of this cedar tree or-, or uh, The side scan will help you find it. And then the GPS on the same unit right. when you mark it, it's there. And if, you know, he talked on, uh, you know, some of the different technology, but a phone, you know, everybody's got a phone, uh, the Navionics, you can, you can, you can mark waypoints on your Navionics. So, um, it'll show you speed. It'll uh, show if you you're speed, all kind, there's all kinds uh, of, that uh, Navionics app will uh, actually show how fast you're trolling, yeah. uh, to keep you at that same rate of speed. Nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, he touched on live scope. I, if you if you don't know what we're talking about, you know you can read into it just a little bit. But uh, that's really changed the game. Uh, is that just, Garmin. It is it Garmin. Is. That's right. And Lawrence has just come out with a yeah. uh, newer version. Uh, their first version uh, wasn't as successful as what they were wanting, but uh, 
I think they fixed some of the bugs and stuff, mm -hmm. and it's it's starting to come out. Uh, but those two are the kind of, Garmin's been the front runner on it. They've had it to themselves, uh, got great customer service. Uh, it's a little aggravating. It's not glitch free. I've had a few issues, but uh, the pros so outweigh the cons. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a totally different. But but get what you can afford. You know, don't. Uh... You know, if you're just getting into this, you know, and it's basics, uh, get what you can afford, um, you know. And if you know you're going to be doing it, put a dollar or two back. Yeah. It's yeah. the the technology. You don't have to have it to go out and have a good time. But if you're going to get into the uh, tournament side of things, uh, you need that extra technology. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it just to go out uh, uh, and catch a, a mess of fish in the spring, uh, you you don't have to have it. But, that. Uh, uh, especially on these lakes that fluctuate so much. If you're good out, uh, and if you got it, like he said, the Navionics app on your uh, smartphone or triangulate, there's there's a lot of ways of doing it but you can see everything that you need to fish. And we touched on some of the stuff that we'd fish in the summer being exposed, but as the water level rises is kind of as spring, as, as you go from winter into spring, those fish are moving shallow. A lot of times, uh, a lot of years, you'll catch the same fish or the same brush piles that you fish in the spring for black ones shallow you can go back and fish those same beds in the summer and catch white fish that are out uh, off the same brush. Mm -hmm. Instead of catching them in five and six foot deep in the spring when they're spawning, they may be 20 or 25 foot deep in the summer. Okay. That's good stuff. I don't want to redirect you for some. Oh, fast no, we're with just, to, you know, if, if y'all have any questions, throw them at us. We uh, will try our best to answer them. Um, if we don't, if we don't know an answer, we'll make something up. Hey, I will. Uh, you'd asked us. Uh, you'd asked to show that uh, knot right there. Show a simple knot okay. for a person that doesn't really know how to tie one on. Okay. And then show us how to tie two pieces of line together. Show him a loop knot. Okay. Uh, he's going to tie a loop knot, and this is super important in the summertime. Um, you're you're dead sticking, if you will. You're you're straight over the fish, uh, single poling, and your jig. Uh, your jig needs to hang uh, horizontal in the water. Okay. Uh, if you tie a cinch knot, oftentimes if you get caught, uh, you know, on brush or something like that, it'll turn your jig vertical just like it this. It slides. It slides. That's on right. The on the eye. That loop knot allows your jig um, to hang right all the time. It, and, you, and like Scott said, you're not you're not moving the jig. You are. Uh, it's just hanging uh, vertical. Now this. This don't do a real good representation. Uh, when it's in the water, this right here will pick this end up right here and it'll hang just like that. Okay. So and that's just, a loop knot. You you thread the you thread it through the eye. You've got uh, one strand. Here's the tie again. Uh, you just take, I'm trying to get it to where y'all can see, uh, grab it like that right there. Take two fingers and go around both fingers with your jig. Hold the jig in your strong hand. And when you go around the two fingers one time and then kind of spread your two fingers apart, which I've got it toward me, but you're going to take it through the loop that you just made two times. And you want to cinch it down fairly close to the eye where you don't have a real big loop. It don't have to be uh, right down next to it, but fairly close. That way your hook don't slide back. And then you just kind of cinch it down. And you've got right there, you can kind of see the loop uh, right there. And what that does is, like Neil was saying, it allows it to lay horizontal. We also like to use that when we're pitching or swimming it. That way that the, the bait can lay naturally. Yeah. Uh, this this is not the strongest knot you can tie. Uh, you know, we're fishing for crappie, not bluefin tuna or nothing like that. So, uh, you know, 
it works well. You know, you don't need a um, super duper knot all the time. That's that's a loop knot. It's quick. Yeah, it is well, quick. It's, it's quick and, and and you'll get good at it. And a lot of action on your. <laughs> and if you're running a tandem, uh, sometimes you'll put two jigs on uh, on the same line. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do that same knot and just leave more tag for your second hook. Okay. The tie you first went on, and then come down and uh, and you could tie your second one on the same. I'll, I'll show that real quick. When you prefer to run two lures over one, a uh, long line, and we do uh, oftentimes. Um, you know, just put more bait in front of the fish. What I do, well, I can't see. So you put the heavier one on the bottom or the same size. I like the. I like personally. I like the. Uh, the heavier one on the bottom uh, because it covers two different water levels. Mm -hmm. If you've got the lighter one, a lot of times it'll pull up behind the other one. Okay. So I, I, that's just my personal preference. So everybody has a little uh, different. I'm going to try to do that one more time where y'all can see it. But this time I'll do it to where <laughs> it's the lighting. Yeah, it's the lighting. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Finally got it through. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I think you're holding a short piece of line. To grab the... <laughs> That's exactly hey. what I did. I was pulling it through. Yeah, it's sliding out to, it was sliding out the other end. You got some nice okay. bones laying there. It's hard to figure oh, out yeah. which one you got. This might work a little better. I was sliding it through one side and pulling it out the other. Uh, if I'm going to do a tandem, uh, two jigs, I'll do that same loop knot and I'll just leave uh, about 18 to 20 inches of line left over. I'll go make my loop go through twice and then cinch it down just like I did before of this one, and then pull out the tag line, which is here. You've got about two foot, and then you could tie your second one uh, about 18 inches below the other. That way you're covering, as it's coming through the water, you're covering two different depths of water or with the same, with the same rod. Gotcha. Okay, we'll touch on that. Uh, I'll get this out of the way and then I'll show you the knot to tie a fluorocarbon line. I'll pull me off about, I usually pull out about five, six foot of leader. Uh, that way, if you break it off, you a lot of times you can get three or four. Sure. Uh, trips out of it. I'll tie this other with the, the braid in just where you can see it a little better than what the glyphs is. Guy that uh, helped out with the uh, crappy and trap magnet booth, Marvin Perry, he had actually showed us it's not uh, to tie to attach leader. This right here is actually coming from your rod, the braid, uh, or uh, uh, the gliss or something. And and I like what I, what I was talking about earlier. This line here is stronger. It don't have stretch. Plus, you can see it on the live scope. You can see this line and track it down to your bait. Sometimes, if you if you don't have a real good view of your bait, but You'll take this uh, rod or this line running from your rod, and I like to have it running on my strong hand. That way, I know I, I'm tying everything the same. I'll take my leader, uh, fluorocarbon leader here, and it's running the opposite direction. I overlap them, and I have about uh, maybe ten inches of line from uh, where the where you have both lines for about ten inches. I'll run my hand right back through there and I'll make a loop 
like that with both lines. I'll stick my finger through the loop, twist it three times, and then I'll grab my leader and the tag end and pull back through the loop that I just made like that. And what that does is it's going to pull back against itself. You can see that right there. It's going to interlock like that right there. It makes a real low profile, mm -hmm. a good strong connection, uh, and it won't pull back through. It's pulled against itself on both sides. You won't get that. I'm not the braid, mm -hmm. but I usually use a pair of scissors that I keep a little uh, thing of blade, but you can cut it right down next to the, oh, <laughs> <laughs> just mess it with you. But you can cut real close to that tie again to where it's, you can see how close it is mm -hmm. and it won't, uh, it won't come undone, but that's a, that's a great tool. If you in clear water or you want, uh, you don't want to, uh, braid or the, uh, the gliss or a high vis or whatever. I mean, you can attach mono to mono with this same, uh, with this same, uh, knot. It casts good. It goes through your eyes. You don't have to worry too much about that. So, um, a lot of other knots, if you, uh, have it back in your eyes and you go to cast you'll feel it click as it goes out this is a tight enough knot that it just slides out smooth is there a name for that particular knot uh <laughs> we I don't have, know i idea. have no idea uh, either and we could probably make something up yeah but we're not going to a bunch <laughs> of us no no <laughs> no it's it's pretty common i think it may actually be on the back of the uh gliss uh, no, it's a different knot there, but uh, that's attaching the gliss to uh, that. There's another knot you can use as well. Awesome. Well, I don't really have anything else. If you have anywhere else you want to go with it, I'm sure a lot of our uh, if you've got any other questions. Uh, again, uh, you know, feel free to uh, to ask. Are both y'all on social media? We are. Um, um, can they, again. can they find you that oh, way? They can find us. I'm Neil Alvis. This is Scott Bunch again, if you've forgotten. So um, uh, look us up. Uh, you know, don't hesitate to ask. You know, if you have a question or something, shoot us a message. Shoot us a message. We'll, uh, we'll get back with you and, and uh, communicate with you. But, um, you know, um, again, this is basic crappie fishing. If you're new to it, um, you know. And we just touched the. Uh, no, there, the there's so puzzle. many different techniques yeah. and uh, and you, you learn something every time you go out uh, and uh, but that that'll get just kind of uh, the tip oh, of it yeah and hopefully that'll get you started you know if if we got over your head uh, we apologize or if we talk you know uh, if we weren't up to snuff with you we apologize too so um, you know um, I, we we do uh, appreciate our sponsors that uh, uh, we got Safe House Ministries. Uh, uh, if you get a chance, uh, look up the teddy bear story. It's it's a uh, great testimony. Great testimony, and uh, uh, been fortunate enough to be with some good companies, Crappy Magnet, B and M Poles, uh, and and others that we've had in the past. It's great products that we just grew away from. Uh, our style of fishing because the ones that we may represent or whatever, uh, if, if it's not what we're believing and uh, we're not just going to uh, use something to have our name out sure. there, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's got to be something that uh, we've got confidence that in. we've got confidence in. Yeah. Holler at us if you see us on the water. You know, we'll, we'll be fishing the Crappie USA uh, Trail again this year. Um, in Tennessee, we're going to fish, uh, well, we'll be on Dale Hollow, we'll be on Old Hickory. Where else? In uh, Tennessee. As far as the Crappie, Crappie USA, USA yeah. uh, I think it's it. Holler at us, you know, and uh, uh, 
if you get a chance, again, come out and be with us. East Tennessee Crappie Club, you know, any of the Eastern Lakes, um, come out and be with us. We have a good time with it. We, we certainly enjoy it. Um, it's our hobby, it's our passion, and um, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find enjoyment out of it too. You know, if you uh, put your time in and, and uh, um, one, one quote I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you with, I've said this, uh, and you can apply it to any of your daily lives. The harder you work, the luckier you get. So keep that in mind. You know, uh, if you see somebody, uh, you know, catching fish every time they go and you're not doing uh, so well, you know, just utilize your search tools, uh, you know, put some brush in, you know, just keep after it, keep at it and uh, um, enjoy it. Um, awesome. Any more questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see, just a lot of thank yous from several people. Thank you for taking your time to do this great stuff. Enjoyed it. Um, where can we access this later? Um, we're going to post this on YouTube and I will email directly everybody that was in this class the link to that. So you'll have it and you can share it with, with whoever. So I'll hopefully be able to do that tomorrow or by Monday at the latest. Um, one question here, where will you put in when, you, when you're at Cherokee in a few weeks? I guess, where's your tournament lead from? Uh, that's, uh, with our club, it's on, we will actually meet at Bow Launch Road. Uh, I'm not sure the physical address. If you turn next to Weigel's uh, off of 25, right before you get to Olin Marshall Bridge, mm -hmm. uh, you take a ride at Weigel's. Uh, Cherokee Park is right on your left, but you're going to come about a mile and a half and uh, it'll be, uh, you'll pass Mountain View Meadows on your right. It'll be the next left at uh, Water's Eight. Edge. Mm -hmm. it, there'll be a sign for Water's Edge subdivision. You'll take that left and we'll meet out there. But if you, if you look at, uh, if you look it up on the uh, internet at, or the Facebook page for East Tennessee Crappy Club, it'll have all the specs and may even have a link to the, to that address later on. But uh, it's, we'll meet there, have a uh, pre-tournament, uh, go over the rules and regulations for any new members, and then they'll release you. And you actually have 30 minutes to get to wherever you want to fish. Uh, a lot of people don't have these bass boats or whatever. Uh, a lot of people fish out of aluminum boats. And it just makes, it's, it's an honor type system. We don't, uh, you can give try. out polygraphs. Yeah. You, you can, uh, you're your own. Uh, Are you weighing them yourself or is it a weight no, thing? No, we, 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 have. We, we have a scales and everything okay. when we come back, but you just don't start fishing. You. Uh, you leave at like seven o'clock. I'm not sure exact times for this one, but it'll, uh, we'll go over all of it that morning. But you'll say so you'll leave at seven, start lines in at 730. You'll quit fishing at three or 330. And you'll have an hour to get back to the weigh-in line. Uh, and you can trailer. So you know, if you if you fish uh, the other end of the lake, and it's a it would be an, an hour and a half run in a boat. Or if trailer. it's yeah, or if it's windy, uh, yeah. February it's going to be cold. Instead of having to make a long run, yeah. you can actually trailer to another ramp that's closer to that creek. Instead of getting out in big water where it yeah. may be too windy for your smaller boat you put in an area that's closer to where you will be fishing and, and just makes a lot safer. And, and it's set up kind of the same uh, layout as what the crap USA tournaments and, are. And your, your club is open for anybody to join basically? Oh yeah, yeah, it's, uh, uh, and, and you get all different, uh, you, you have the start out angler and it'll benefit them and it'll benefit the advanced angler and, uh, not just uh, not just with the tournaments itself. It's uh, the other stuff that they do in the off season as well. Let's say somebody wants to join. They don't have a boat. Can they come and fish with somebody else? Or they have to have their own rig. Right now, they uh, they don't have anything. Uh, if if they're a member, a lot of times uh, we have guys that fish with other guys that may not have a. Neil and I usually fish ninety five percent of the tournaments we fish. We fish together. Uh, but a lot of guys may just be one guy and they'll fish with different partners in the club 
both of them may have a boat, but they may join together. Say, hey, uh, you got anybody going with you this week? And they'll fish together. So, uh, talk to somebody in the club. Matt uh, may know somebody that's looking for a partner, and they can hook hook each other up too. Like to invest in somebody new. Oh, yeah, share knowledge with them. Exactly. Them, train them up. Um, yeah, we would love new members, but you don't even have to be a member to fish. Entry fee is higher if a non-member. So you can right. come and fish as a non-member. Yeah, you can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm not going to tarry any longer. Oh, I thank y'all for, for doing this. This is excellent. And uh, and somebody's asking, we need on-the-water classes. I know that'd be really difficult to do, but hopefully, like I said, we'll do a, a drop the tailgate um, and get out on the water and you can demonstrate some of these yeah. We'd love techniques. To. We, we would love to, and we certainly appreciate uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, you know, for giving us opportunity, and uh, yeah, it's uh, really enjoyed it. Enjoyed the the participation, you know, and excellent. It's uh, um, these guys appreciate the questions because they they do seminars sometimes, and sometimes okay. somebody will even ask a question that makes you feel yeah. like is anybody even listening? Yeah. Do they even care what I said? Yeah. These people cared, and and I thank you on behalf of TWR and everybody that joined us tonight. It's excellent stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us.